Today on InGrace, we're launching deep into space as we explore our awesome universe and figure out how we got here, Big Bang or Big God. Are you looking for hope? My amazing parents taught me to look for hope in the Lord, and that gave me a passion to explore God's incredible creation. I'm Jim Scudder, Jr. Let's go on an adventure together and discover hope in grace. There are two choices, the so-called Big Bang, or in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Welcome to In Grace's series, our awesome universe, Big Bang or Big God. After interviewing astronaut Charlie Duke, who walked on the moon, I wanted to tell the story of our amazing universe. We will explore a question that many people think about. How did all this get here? How did we get here? Is this all just a galactic accident or are we here by design and with purpose? I had watched a really good video series called Creation Astronomy. And in this fascinating series, the host, Spike Pissaris, formerly an engineer in the US military space program and an atheist and evolutionist, studied the evidence about the universe. After doing this for himself, he became a creationist. And so I contacted Spike and he agreed to an interview. We set up a trip out to where he lives in Washington State. But before we take you to Washington, I also had the chance to meet a Christian PhD astronomer. His name is Danny Faulkner, and he does research and speaking for Answers in Genesis in the Cincinnati area. He also agreed to an interview with us and offered to show us Answers in Genesis newly remodeled state-of-the-art planetarium. I love this planetarium. This is really cool. And as an astronomer, you have to really be like a giddy over having something like this. Yeah, it's a great educational tool. People have no idea how big the, um, the, the, the universe is. You sometimes see in books, you'll see a picture of the sun here and you'll see the planets all wind up. First yeah. of all, they never all line up like that. <laughs> and the sizes may be right compared to the size of the sun, but the distances are completely wrong. If you try to get the distances right on a page, then the sizes, you can't even see them, they're so small. In our daily lives, it's difficult to perceive the size and scale of the universe. The Earth alone is far bigger than we can really comprehend. Even though there are roughly 7 billion people in the world, the Earth is so big that every person in the world could fit into the state of Texas with more than 1,000 square feet per person. But even at that size, the Earth is small compared to Jupiter. And Jupiter is far smaller than our Sun. Our Sun is so big that you could fit over 1 million Earths inside of it. Yet the Sun is small compared to Sirius A, which is a brilliant blue-white star, the brightest star we can see in the sky. But even Sirius is dwarfed by orange giants like Pollux, Arcturus, and Aldebaran. And even these giants are tiny compared to such stars as Rigel, Antares, and Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is as wide as 1,180 suns. But even Betelgeuse is dwarfed by the supergiant stars, including V.Y. Canis Majoris, the largest star we know of so far. For perspective, here's a comparison of our Sun to V.Y. Canis Majoris. The variety and sizes of stars are enough to humble us before our Creator. One of the most obvious things in the summer sky is uh, this, this constellation down here we call Scorpius. This bright star right there, kind of red star, that is called Antares. That name means rival of Mars. Aries was the name that the Greeks had for the Roman Mars. It's because it's a red star, orange, and it uh, contrasts quite nicely with the red or orange color that, that Mars has. It marks the heart of the scorpion. The head is right here, and if you look carefully, you can see the body kind of curl down like this. And at the end of the tail, there are two stars here that mark the stinger. Mm. 
on the, uh, can you see the scorpion there? I, I can see it now, but uh, I bet you. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, one of the things we, we can do in the in the, in the the planetarium sky, we can't do in the real sky, is we can put up stick figures, an outline. Yes, that's what I was hoping. So let's do that. So we put the stick figure up. That really shows it up nicely. It does. And, uh, you know, I've found that some people don't have as much imagination as I have. And so I, I see a beautiful scorpion up there, but some people just can't see that. So we can put artwork up to help you. So let's look at that, too. The artwork can really help. And there you go. Uh, yeah. There's really a scorpion in the sky. <laughs> a lot of people wonder, though, how, if the Earth is young, as we think it is, according to the biblical chronology, how would we be able to see starlight from such distances? Yeah, that's a question we get quite frequently. We call it the distant starlight problem. There are several different solutions. I've got my own out there. The stars were given certain purposes. The plants on the earth were given certain purposes. When God says the creation is very good at the conclusion of the creation week, and sometimes during the day, creation days, it's good, that referred, I think, to purpose. The, the, the things that were created were created to fulfill their purposes and to function. Well, there are a number of purposes and functions given to the heavenly bodies but they can't fulfill their purposes if they are not visible mm. by Adam on day six, if nothing else. What I believe happened on day four in comparison to what happened on day three with the plants is God not only created the, the heavenly bodies, but he brought their light very rapidly toward the earth, not in a material or physical or natural way, but in a supernatural way. It's a miracle. Yeah. And as a scientist, I, have, I don't have a problem with miracles. Some mm. scientists say, well, you can't have that. Well, they don't normally happen. But the creation of the universe is, I think, a non-natural, non-physical event. There's a very strong argument you can make there. Yeah. We can look for what we call the summer triangle. And we call it summer triangle because it forms a triangle of three bright stars, and they're there uh, all summer long. So let's go ahead and put the stick figures up. There you go. And uh, that will help you to, to pick that out. And each of those three stars have names. The brighter one up here is named Vega. If we can go ahead and put the title up on the dome. There you go. This one down here is called Altair. And over here we have Deneb. And uh, each one of those, we call these first magnitude stars, they're very bright in their, in their own constellations. Deneb is one of my favorite stars. It's a blue supergiant. And it's actually brighter than any of the other stars you see in the sky here. Of course, it doesn't look as bright as some of the others. That's because it's very far away. Our current best measurement of Deneb is a little uncertain, is about 3,000 light years. Now, if you go back 3,000 years, we're talking around 1,000 BC. So I like to point out to people, if that distance is reasonably correct, then the light you're now receiving from that star could have left that star when Solomon was building the temple. Mm. Maybe David was was still on the throne at that point. So that's a really cool star. Yeah. Uh, Vega is much closer. It's only about uh, 26 light years away from us. People are wondering if there's life outside of Earth, right, on, on another planet. What is your opinion? I don't think so. And we at Answers in Genesis don't think so. You know, it comes down to purpose, comes down to design. Uh, I think the Bible is geocentric in the sense that God's attention is centered upon man. And uh, when people ask about life on other planets, they're generally thinking in terms of beings like us. If they're truly like us, then they have eternal destinies like us. And if so, are they in need of salvation? If they're in need of salvation, why? And uh, does God have a plan of redemption for them? Well, if that's the case, then wouldn't that necessitate that Jesus go and live a life there, be born a virgin, live a perfect life, die for atonement of sins for their race, just as he did for Adam's race on earth? And I think the obvious answer would be yes, if that's the case. Mm -hmm. Well, it's pretty clear from the New Testament, numerous passages in the New Testament, numerous authors, when Jesus left this world, he didn't go to another world. He went to sit at the right hand of the Father. And so, and he also died once. Died once for all. He right. went quite literally, I do believe. So uh, I'm of the opinion that uh, there's no life out there. People then ask, well, what about bacteria and plants and so forth? That comes down to uh, dominion and authority. Is there anybody in charge like on earth? And if there's only plant life or, or, or microbial life, uh, that doesn't really count in most people's estimation. Mm -hmm. So I can't prove to you that there's no life out there, but I'm pretty confident theologically, biblically speaking, that we're the only sentient life or beings like us out and, there. And the earth does seem very unique and central too in the scope of the oh, universe. Oh, absolutely. There's 
the abundant information that the Earth is is truly unique. You know, we've discovered more than 4,000 planets orbiting other stars. And out of that, we haven't found one yet that's even remotely Earth-like. That's, that's a pretty powerful argument, I think, for the uniqueness of the Earth. The data actually support that, that conclusion. And there's a lot of criteria that would have to be perfect uh, for life to exist on another planet, not just, you know, distance from the sun, but so many other variables mm -hmm. too. Yeah. So it's this is a very special and unique place that uh, in our theology, studying the scripture, this is it. It is. You've been studying this your whole life and you see incredible symmetry, you see purpose, you see design and the vastness of the universe beyond our human brain's comprehension, size of the stars. Does that speak to a design, a purpose, a creator, or does it speak to chaos? No, I, I think the universe speaks of, of design. Um, one of the, the neat things about the world is design built into the physics there. For instance, the inverse square law of gravity. And Newton noticed this when he came up with this uh, 350, almost 400 years ago now. And um, he realized that inverse square law is the only form that will give you closed orbits. I mean, orbits that actually close around. And he, he, was, he was impressed with that. He realized that itself was designed. So the, the design really is in, in the really minutia point uh, places and also in the, the framework that we have here. If you change this or change that, the universe would, would not exist as it does. We could not be here. And that's where I see the design showing up. It should cause us to reflect on the fact that, well, if we are created, then maybe our creator has some expectations of us. Maybe he wants to have us live a certain way or acknowledge him some way and, and live according to his, uh, his dictates. And um, if that's the case, then you can't do that from science, but you can going to scripture. It should cause us to turn to scripture to find out more about our creator because our eternal destinies rely upon that. I know the Bible in Isaiah 40, it seems like God has names for all the stars. Yes, it says in a couple of places in the Bible, not only that he counts the stars, which we can't do because there are too many, as creator he can, it also says he names them. We have names, proper names for a couple hundred stars. Huh. We have catalog names for a few millions. They're just numbers, basically. Yeah. That's incredible if God has named all the stars and knows those names and knows the number of stars. I mean, that's mind boggling. Oh, it is. Because of the number of stars, it's, you know, it's beyond human comprehension. Like, a, is it septillion or some some number like that? It's a hundred billion galaxies. And a hundred billion, and a few hundred billion, billion stars, in, stars each galaxy. in each galaxy. So it's just un, staggering. unbelievable, it's staggering. staggering, right. But it speaks to the power of God's intellect, I guess. Yeah, wow, incredible. Aren't you amazed when you see the incredible design and beauty of our universe? Let me send you this print, the Eagle Nebula, for free. And this will tell everybody that you believe that God created the heavens and the earth. Let me also encourage you to get our entire four-part series, Our Awesome Universe, Big Bang or Big God. Contact us right now. Receive your free poster of the Eagle Nebula. When you give a gift of $20 or more, we will include the four-part video series, Our Awesome Universe, Big Bang or Big God. Call us right now at 800-78-GRACE or visit us online at ingrace.tv to get this limited time offer. The evolutionist says, the truth is that we don't understand star formation at a fundamental level. But the Bible says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The evolutionist says, Nobody really understands how star formation proceeds. It's really remarkable. The Bible says, Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name. 
There were 48 constellations handed down to us by a man named uh, Claudius Ptolemy in the second century AD. And there's good evidence that the constellations are much older than that. You can do a little sleuthing with what's called precession. Precession cycle is a slow shifting of the celestial poles in the sky and hence positions in the sky. By figuring that out, there are some gaps that currently occur in the sky the ancient Greeks didn't have. And we can run the, like we can on a planetarium, we can run it into the past to um, figure out what time it coincided with roughly what position. And the position's around 35 degrees latitude north, give or take a couple of degrees. And the time period is around uh, 2500 BC, give or take a couple of centuries. Interesting, that location coincides with the immediate post-flood, and the t date does too, the immediate post-flood civilization there in the plain of Shinar hmm. in the Middle East. And uh, I believe the constellations were codified at the time of the Tower of Babel and were carried around the world. And, you know, even in North America, natives here had certain constellations, the uh, big bear and the little bear. Many Native Americans had those constellations. Mm. People in Asia had those, uh, Europe had those constellations, indicating a common origin, I believe. Mm. But it matches beautifully with the chronology we find in Scripture. So I think the constellations we have around the world actually give a confirmation for the biblical timeline. Wow. And one of the things I could, I, could, I could point out to you here uh, before moving on is I mentioned the, uh, the motion across the sky. And so if we can just speed that motion up, I can show you how they move from east to west across the sky. So go ahead and do that, Quinn. Wow. There you go. And you know, the sun does this every day. It rises over there in the east. You can see constellations rising in the east. They set in the west just like the sun does. That is incredible. And there's a sun over there, by the way. It just came up. <laughs> Look at that. But you still have the stars out, which is nice. Yeah, we can do that in the planetarium. In real sky, of course, you can't do that. So there are a lot of neat things we can do in the planetarium you can't do anywhere else. The stars, obviously, God says very clearly what they're for, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Mm -hmm. I don't think evolution would have any explanation for why there would be all of these bodies. Yes, the day four account of uh, creation about astronomy gives a number of purposes, providing light on the earth, so divide light from day to be uh, for signs and for seasons and days and years, it's calendrical purposes. And uh, we, we could spend a lot of time talking about those different purposes. But um, if you believe in an evolutionary worldview, there, there is no creator, then the stars have absolutely no purpose whatsoever. We don't have any purpose whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not designed for anything. Nothing is designed. Any design we may think we see is just an illusion. And uh, ultimately, there is no meaning to life whatsoever. If you follow that through, that is a very depressing <laughs> view it of the is. world. And it's, um, it's driven some people to despair, believe it yeah. or not. The evolutionist says, the universe we see when we look out to its furthest horizons contains a hundred billion galaxies. Each of these galaxies contains another hundred billion stars. That's 10 to the 22 stars all told. The silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is that we do not know how even a single one of these stars managed to form. The Bible says, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. The evolutionary model has failed, not only scientifically, but also spiritually. This is especially true for those who deny the existence of God. The atheist is blind to the beauty and majesty of our Lord's creation. He sees the universe as a hopeless, bleak place. As one atheist said, it is very hard to realize that this all is just a tiny part of an overwhelmingly hostile universe. It is even harder to realize that this present universe faces a future extinction of endless cold or intolerable heat. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. In contrast to this, the Bible says, Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest and every tree therein. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. Let me introduce you to the God of the universe. God created all that we see. That's what the evidence says. We couldn't have come from nothing because the Big Bang has something where it exploded from. 
Therefore, it takes more faith to believe we got here by accident than just trusting that we got here by a big God who has a purpose and a reason for our existence. This God that created all that we see loves us. How do I know? Because it says that in his word. The Bible gives us all the information we need to be saved from our sins, to be saved from hell, to be saved to heaven. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, for God so loved the world. This God that created all of these incredible things, created the world. He loves you. He loves me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That is Jesus. Jesus didn't sin. He never sinned, but he was put onto a cross and he died for our sins. And Jesus says, if you will believe in me, believe in him, whosoever does that, trusts in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you want to be saved, if you want to know the God that created all of this, that created you, put your faith in Jesus, the Son of God, who died on a cross and rose again for you. Trust in him, and the Bible says you will be saved today, tomorrow, and forever. Aren't you amazed when you see the incredible design and beauty of our universe? Let me send you this print, the Eagle Nebula, for free. And this will tell everybody that you believe that God created the heavens and the earth. Let me also encourage you to get our entire four-part series, Our Awesome Universe, Big Bang or Big God. Contact us right now. Receive your free poster of the Eagle Nebula. When you give a gift of $20 or more, we will include the four-part video series, Our Awesome Universe, Big Bang or Big God. Call us right now at 800-78-GRACE or visit us online at ingrace.tv to get this limited time offer. Join us next week for part two of Our Awesome Universe, Big Bang or Big God. Did anyone have an idea that there might be as many stars as the Bible says? No. <laughs> With the naked eye and a really dark sky, you can see a few thousand stars. Of course, Galileo was one of the first people to then realize there are thousands and thousands of more stars than we could ever imagine. So you, you would then say, well, God must know what he's talking about. People that put down the Bible don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Yep. Record every single In Grace episode. You will be so blessed as we learn all about God's world and God's Word. In Grace is a viewer-supported ministry. Thank you for your prayers and gifts.